So today, our first point is going to be righteous. We're going to look at the righteousness, or really the righteous characteristics of Anna and Simeon. But first, really, we're going to look kind of continuing on the last few weeks of Mary and Joseph's righteous attitude, their righteous characteristics. If you look in this entire passage, what we were looking at in verses 26, or sorry, not 26, 22 through 40, we will see the word law of the Lord, or law referenced or specifically written down five times. So if you look in your scriptures, it's something you can highlight, it's something you can underline, because it's giving us an understanding of why Mary and Joseph are doing the things that they're doing. They're being very diligent to fulfilling all of the requirements for this born son. They are being very intentional. It sets the stage of Jesus' life. As we looked at over the last few weeks, we have seen how God in his perfect timing placed Jesus under the care of his mother Mary and his earthly father Joseph, right? This wasn't just because it happened to be them, God picked a number out of a hat or did a bingo machine, but that he was intentionally preparing the hearts of these people. And as we've looked over this entire series, looking at the cast of Christmas, if we were to mistake any of these people as being unimportant or just happenstance or just circumstance, we will have missed everything. If we would forget about Mary, or sorry, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, right? God chose them to have Jesus' effectively cousin, John the Baptist, who would be the one to prepare the way, right? And Zechariah, because of his, uh, honestly, probably fear and doubt, is held silent for the last six months or more of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy, right? So we've seen them. We see Mary and Joseph, how when the angel comes to them and reveals to them that this baby boy, the Savior to come, will be born of this lady who is a virgin, we see how they are faithful and obedient. They are righteous. When we see the shepherds, we see how faithful they are. When they hear the sign from the angel, they're like, we're going to go. We're going to go see this baby. And then after they have encountered Jesus, they go and tell other people. That continues today when we look at both Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna. We're going to see what is going on. So if you would, look with me again in verses 22 through 25. It says, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, this word there is referencing specifically Mary and Joseph. After you were given birth to a son, a lady was called to be un ceremonial unclean for the first seven days and then 33 days after that. And then on the 41st day, see, there's your math lesson, they would come to the temple so that they could make the purification. That's what is referenced there in verse 23. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. We see Mary and Joseph are called to be righteous. We saw that Mary's response to being called to by the Lord that she was worshipful, right? Remember, the Magnificat is the name of that particular passage that we looked at, and you can actually look a little bit past backwards in Luke chapter 1, and it starts in verse 46, but you see how she responds to being told that she's going to have this baby. My soul magnifies the Lord. She worships, right? Joseph worships. They worship the fact that what God has done and is doing in the life of this little baby boy who's done really nothing at this point in, his human, in a human sense, right? He was just born. That's really all that they have done. They are waiting, but we see how according to the law of Moses, as it is written in the law of Moses, what is said in the law of the Lord, according to the custom of the law, all of these points, all of these references, Luke is making it so, so clear to us that Joseph and Mary are doing things right. These are small details. These are details that are about Jesus, that things Jesus isn't even doing. Jesus, as a little eight-day-old baby, isn't like, hey, it's time for me to go to the temple. It's time for me to be uh, declared as a boy in the nation of Israel, following the steps of our ancestor Abraham. But we see how Joseph is the spiritual leader of his family. 
even though this is his adopted son, he is taking the proper steps of raising him to be a correct Jewish person. He is leading his family in the right way. They are going to Jerusalem to worship and fulfill their commitment to raising God's son. If we look in verse 27, we can see a little bit about <clears throat> Simeon. It says, this is referring to Simeon, and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents, Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. Simeon is righteous. Luke even writes that down for us. He says that this man was righteous and devout. And a lot of times in this first century uh, Israel, you would see righteous and devout would also sometimes describe what they would think as the Pharisees. And as we look across the rest of the Gospels, being righteous and devout in the land of Israel meant following what the Pharisees thought was accurate, meant following the way, the custom of that time. Simeon is different. Simeon is not adding on to God's laws, but he is doing specifically what God's law commands. He is righteous and devout in the eyes of the Lord. There's a difference here. Simeon is not necessarily looking like the rest of the Pharisees. Simeon is actually, um, you can go and uh, there is, a, I would guess, probably 5th or 4th century literature that references all of the important rabbis across the history of Israel. You can look it up, that they have a, effectively a spiritual genealogy of all of the important ones. And Simeon is not listed because he is not following the path that they would have done. As we see here, if he was to make this proclamation regarding this little baby, this would turn the tables on everything that they would have expected, right? Even Jesus' disciples, when they asked Jesus towards the end of his earthly ministry, they asked him, is now the time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus comes and he says, that's not for you to know. That's not going to happen at this moment. So, Jesus, even as a little baby, is recognized by Simeon to being important. Simeon is righteous. We see he does what is according to the custom of the law. He is not only knowledgeable regarding the things of scriptures, but he is also obedient, right? He does what is according, according to the custom of the law. Righteousness is always linked to obedience. You can't just be righteous only in your thoughts. Righteousness has to be an outpouring as well. It is not something that like, oh, I know the right thing to do, but I'm going to justify my actions a different way. That's not what righteousness truly looks like. Righteousness is understanding God's word, properly applying it, and then acting out in obedience. We are declared righteous by the Lord so that we would be and act righteously, if that makes sense. However, it still always is an outpouring. The, the fruit of a Christian walk is always present, regardless sorry, of how small it may be. When we look again, look with me, jump ahead to verse 39. It may not come up on the screens, but it says, this is regarding Mary and Joseph. It says, and when they, Mary and Joseph, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord. There's important things there. They had performed some things. Most of the things. No, everything according to the law of the Lord. They fulfilled their commitment. This is part of the reason why God gave Jesus to be with Mary and Joseph. They were not going to cut corners because it might have been inconvenient. We see here that if, if you look back in Luke chapter 2, verse 24, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, this is effectively the, the least expensive option for this rite of purification. They were not doing the most expensive thing. Joseph and Mary would have not been very rich. They would have done, effectively, the, the economy package for purification. They're being faithful to fulfilling their obligation, and the Lord, in his wisdom and in his providence, in setting these ground rules back in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, he knew that one day his son's family would be poor but rich in spirit. They would know the Lord. We will see how all of these things tie up in a little bit. But as we continue, we see that Mary and Joseph carry out everything in line with the law of the Lord. We should not miss this. Luke practically trips over himself in making this point. He insists that in every respect, Jesus is a kosher Savior. 
He refers to Jesus' circumcision, how they offer the sacrifices required for his mother's purification from childbirth, how they present their infant as a firstborn to the Lord, and how they pay the redemption price. Jesus was given to faithful, obedient, and righteous parents. This is important for us because, one, there's a bunch of little people in the room today. (laughs) Praise God for that. That means if you have a little person sitting next to you, you have been blessed by God to be faithful, obedient, and righteous parents. We are not to look at Joseph and Mary and think, that's that's too high of a standard for us. We are to look at them and say, that is the way that we will be faithful, that we will do everything according to the law of the Lord. I know today's sermon is supposed to be about Simeon and Anna, but this is so much of my text today that for me to overlook it as a next-gen pastor would effectively do myself injustice. One of the cool things about Eric, Pastor Eric, that he always says is that I am a tool in your tool belt. I'm not the whole tool belt. I'm not the toolbox. I get to be part of helping you raise your kids. But if you look at maybe even the last few weeks, apart from your kids, your students, your little ones that might be downstairs, they might see me only on Sunday morning. This is the week where you would have spent the most amount of time with your family. That's why next week we're starting Forgiveness and Boundaries, because sometimes that's hard. (laughs) But praise the Lord that he has given you small kids. It is a good thing that you would be faithful with the children that are under your care. Some of you may have regrets about how you've raised your children in the past. The Lord knows, and we will see how the Lord handles that even a little bit more in our sermon here. But as we focus in on what God is doing, I want us to recognize that God is being very faithful, and he is very generous even to Jesus in giving him the parents of Joseph and Mary. Joseph practically disappears from the gospel narratives after this. But we see the example that we are given about Joseph. He was going to divorce Mary quietly. He didn't want to put her to shame. He accepts the fact that his bride-to-be was pregnant with another person's baby, with the Lord's baby. He accepts that. He follows God's plan. So we see Joseph is faithful. So now we're going to jump into actually Simeon and Anna in a little bit. So look with me in verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. We see Simeon, and the way that we see Simeon is that he is described as righteous and devout and waiting. He's waiting. We don't, aren't necessarily given a timeline of how long Simeon has been waiting for this moment. But he was told by God that he would not see death, he would not die, until he saw the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the coming Savior. So if you have been given a promise by God like Simeon, and you know that you will not die, and you start to get increasingly old in age, do you think he started to fret? Do you think he started to worry? Or do you think he held firm in God's promises? The answer comes... Because the waiting isn't before the righteous and devout. He is described as righteous and devout before he is described as waiting. So we know that he is just waiting and eagerly anticipating. We see this phrase, the consolation of Israel. And to sum that up is effectively the hope that will come in the Messiah. The Jews would see from various passages of Scripture, you could look at Isaiah 61 primarily, that speak of God comforting his people. That he, and at the time of redemption by the Messiah, it would be his work, the Messiah's work, to comfort those that mourn, to mend the brokenhearted, to lift up those who are hurting, because the Messiah is anointed by the Spirit of the Lord. It gives us hope, and it helps us understand even more about Jesus when we look at some of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 4, chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That word comforted and console, uh, consolation of Israel all related. So when we look at this text, we are seeing that Jesus himself is being prophesied about, about something that he will fulfill later in his own life. 
So Simeon, in being righteous and devout and hearing from the Lord, is patiently waiting for God. We see how he was waiting for the Christ to be born and to accomplish his work. Galatians 4.4 puts it this way. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. He's born Mary's son. He's born Joseph's son, adopted son. But he's also born under the law. We see that. This verse wouldn't exist if Mary and Joseph did not accomplish and do everything according to the law of the Lord. That's why we read verse 39, so that when we look at it, we could see, most importantly, that Jesus is coming to fulfill all of the righteous obligations of the law. I don't know how many of you have ever read Leviticus. Maybe starting tomorrow you're going to embark on a year through the Bible. Uh, Sometimes most people try to time that up, and right around like March or so is when people get to Leviticus. And March is typically like, "Ah, I did my New Year's resolution for two months, we're good to go, right? Where's that New Testament when you need it? But Leviticus, if you read through Leviticus, you see the high standard that God has. And the high standard is a perfect standard. That, That is the standard to be perfect. Jesus comes and accomplishes all of the law. That's why he's born under it, so that he would fulfill it, so that you and I do not have to go and fulfill all of those things. Jesus is the perfect Savior because his parents raised him until the point where Jesus started acting in his own volition and his own will because at this point, as a human, Jesus is a little baby, 40 days old, tiny, helpless, divine. And he is raised under the law. He is born under the law. We learn that his parents and Simeon were righteous. And that kind of segues us into our next point, we see specifically Simeon and Anna are patient. They are patient. Simeon is described as waiting. Waiting. Let's look in verse 26 through 32. And it had been revealed to him, this is Simeon, by the, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple... And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon is promised by God that he will not die until he sees the Messiah. He had seen with a heart of faith, right? He is eagerly anticipating this. He has placed his hope and his faith in the coming Messiah. Just like all of the forefathers prior to the birth of Jesus had done. Abraham was given a promise that one day from his family, all of the families of the earth would be blessed. We see through Noah that God would not destroy the earth ever again. We see through David that one day one of his kids would rule over effectively the entire world forever. We see through all of these promises when we get to Jeremiah 31 that there will be a new covenant and that God will place his word upon their hearts, that he will give them a heart of flesh, not of stone, that when people come to faith, they have eyes for a Messiah that they may not see face to face in this life. But Simeon was given a promise, and he was faithfully waiting, faithfully patient, waiting for it to come. He already believed that God would send the consolation of Israel. One thing that we know is that this is not the first time, even in the Christmas story, that people were confident in the birth and the coming of the Messiah before they ever saw him. Mary. Mary is told this is going to happen, and she goes, Lord, let it be done to your servant as you have said. She is confident that God will fulfill his promises. Joseph is told before he's even confident that his that baby is even not his, if that makes sense. We see that Mary believes the angel, Joseph believes the angel. John the Baptist, as a new, as not even a newborn, as a baby in the womb, jumps for joy. Elizabeth greets the mother of her Lord. The shepherds believe, they act on faith, and they go meet him. They haven't seen him at all, but Simeon is given a promise to see the Messiah in the flesh. He's been serving the Lord consistently. 
Can you imagine every single day getting ready and being like, all right, what new babies are coming today? What new baby is going to be here at the temple? And can you imagine what it must have been like? You know, Joseph and Mary are walking up the steps, and maybe he's like, okay, there's somebody. Maybe, maybe these people are here. And he sees the baby, and his heart leaps for joy. What that must have felt like in seeing the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the newborn king, to see a baby and know the consolation of Israel is imminent. It is here. It is coming. When he prophesies in verses 29 through 32, he alludes to Isaiah 49, 6. I'm going to read Isaiah 49, 6. I believe it may come up on the screens. If not, you can flip there. And it says, he says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. This is a promise that God's Messiah was not going to stay within one particular group of people in the Middle East somewhere. That it was for the entire world. It was for the nations that God's salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Jesus is the fulfillment that even I talked about back in Abraham, right? God promised Abraham that one day one of his children, effectively the seed of Abraham, would bless all the families of the earth. Paul picks that up in his letters. As God, as Yahweh called the servant himself in Isaiah 49, 6, Simeon calls the infant he holds your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. He will not only bring salvation, but Jesus himself can rightly be called salvation. Jesus is salvation. Jesus doesn't just bring it. Jesus is salvation. He will not only bring consolation to Israel, but he will be the one to console Israel. For Simeon, salvation is something he can hold in his arms, and he does. In one sense, we can say say salvation is a plan, right? From the foundation, from before the foundation of the world, God knew what would happen. Before the creation of the earth, God knew. God the Father sent God the Son so that you and I could know him. But as Isaiah 49 says, also helps us see it is a person. Yahweh's servant Messiah is Yahweh's salvation. Having Jesus, we have salvation. He can rightly be called our salvation. The baby. That's what Simeon sees. In this past, uh, I don't know how many of you still have Christmas decorations up. But Christmas has been a very long season for me. I love Christmas. And if it's a good Christmas song in the sense of speaking about the Lord our God, God the Son being born of a woman in the incarnation, that that meeting of divine and human in one person, I could sing about that year-round. So like back in like July, I was already singing Christmas songs. There is one that is one of my favorites. It's called Who Would Have Dreamed? by a a group called Sovereign Grace. And so I'm going to read a few of the verses. And it says, On a starlit hillside, shepherds watched their sheep. Slowly, David's city drifted off to sleep. But to this little town of no great renown, the Lord had a promise to keep. Prophets had foretold it, a mighty king would come. Long-awaited ruler, God's anointed one. But the sovereign of all looked helpless and small as God gave the world his own son. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. Wondrous gift of heaven, the Father sends the Son. Planned from time eternal, moved by holy love, he will carry our curse and death he'll reverse so we can be daughters and sons. And then it ends, and who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan. It's a beautiful song speaking about not only who this baby is, who this baby was promised to be, who this baby will not become, but who this baby will prove himself to be, and how he saves us through his life, his death, his burial, resurrection, and ascension. Because like Galatians 4, 4 said, he was born under the law in the fullness of time that you and I would know him. That gets us to our third point. We see in this story that 
Jesus is timeless. He's timeless. We're kind of adjusting now from looking at Simeon and Anna to now looking at Jesus and how he is timely. Look with me at verse 33 and 35. It says, And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own heart, your own soul also, so that the thoughts for many hearts may be revealed. Up until this point, it's been hard. You would imagine it would have been difficult giving birth to a baby in a manger, in a stable, in a place designed for animals. And now they're excited. The baby's here. He's healthy. They're doing well. They're fulfilling their duties. They've gotten him fulfilled under the, the covenant with Abraham, right? In circumcision. And then we see that they're bringing him to the temple. And they're, this man has been waiting for this moment. And he's excited and he's holding the baby. And he goes, God, you can let your servant die now in peace. And what does he say to Mary? That a sword will be put through your heart, through your soul. That he will divide the coming Messiah is going to divide. Congratulations, you get to be his parent. He's going to break your heart one day. Heart-wrenching. We don't know all of the details, all of the things that Mary was given and clued into, right? As we looked at with Mary in the, even the Magnificat, Mary knew her scripture, so she probably had a pretty good idea of what would come for her son, the Savior. But Jesus came at the right time. Simeon had been prepared. Zechariah and Elizabeth had been prepared. Mary had been prepared. Joseph had been prepared. But even in God's perfect plan, Jesus must endure so much for our salvation. If we look in verse 34, we see, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. We hear of the dark and costly side of God's redemption, of God's redemptive plan. There's a hard side to the good news. Simeon tells Mary the child will divide, will be the object of enmity and hostility. Jesus comes at great cost. He even said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 26, you need to pay attention. This one's not going to come up on the screen. So you can flip there or you can uh, listen along. So John chapter 15, verses 18 through 26. Jesus is saying, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had, done not, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the, their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. <clears throat> when we look at this, this is a promise. This is Jesus telling his immediate disciples what is going to happen to them. We don't have to get too far past Jesus' ascension, right? We get that in the book of Acts, right at the beginning of the book of Acts. Just a few chapters later, we see the first Christian killed for his faith, right? He prophesies. This is uh, Acts chapter 8, I believe. And what ends up happening is Stephen is giving this great sermon, and then they kill him. They kill P uh, Stephen. Sorry, forgive me. We will endure as much. The world will hate us. There is a book that maybe some of you have heard about, maybe some of you have read. I meant to grab one, but Michaela and I have given our copies away. It's called The Insanity of God. It's by a guy named Nick Ripkin. That's not his name, it's a pseudonym. But Nick Ripkin was a, a missionary in Somalia for a number of years. And I'm going to spoil parts of the book, but what ends up happening, regardless of my spoiling it, you should still go out and find it, or you could come to me in probably a month, and I'll probably have a copy you could, you could have or borrow. But it's a collection of stories from Nick Ripkin's journey across the world to encounter Christians in hard places. Places like Somalia, like Yemen, 
like North Korea, Eritrea, Libya, Nigeria, Pakistan. And I'm going to give you a couple of quotes regarding these persecuted Christians and what they said to Nip when he went to see them. It said, one of them is, suffering is one of God's ordained means for the growth of his church. He brought salvation to the world through Christ, our suffering Savior. And he now spreads salvation in the world through Christians as suffering saints. In the words of Paul, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's 2 Timothy 3.12. Clearly, there is a sense in which the danger of our lives increases in proportion to the depth of our relationship with Christ. It is a, simply a matter of obedience. If he is our Lord, then we will obey him. If we do not obey him, then he is not our Lord. One, two, the two next quotes are probably the hardest for me to read. When he was in, I believe he says East Asia, referencing probably China in a secret house church that is forced not to be able to gather. They, if they gather publicly, they will be shut down and put into prison. For pastors in this part of the world, it is effectively a badge of honor to go to prison because it's effectively where you get seminary training. I get to go online to a school that I can do almost at my own pace, and these men, for proclaiming the gospel, go to prison, and that's where they get the most intensive seminary classes you could ever get. But what they say is, do not ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. That is our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that these people are being beaten and killed and stoned and thrown in prison are saying we will not neglect these things, such as public baptism, such as proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, sharing the gospel in hard situations. These people have not only lost their jobs, their livelihoods, their homes, their families. One of the hardest read, ones to read is this upcoming one. Nick, the author of the book, brings a from Somalia, I believe, to a place like the U.S. or Canada. It comes from, uh, uh, here's a description of what persecution looks like in Somalia. Christians face serious persecution from their family and community. Leaving Islam is regarded as a betrayal of the fam family and clan. And family members and clan leaders will harass, intimidate, and even kill Somalian converts. Anyone even suspected of being a Christian is closely monitored by the elders in the community and even by their own family members. Church life is simply not possible, so the few believers must meet in secret. Islamic militants have intensified their hunt for people who are Christians in a position of leadership. If you want to read more things like this, you can go online to Open Door International, and it has a ranking of all of like the, the hardest places to be a Christian. But this is the quote. So when this man is brought to a worship service in America or Canada, he says, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe that I have lived long enough to see people being baptized in public, an entire family together. No one is shooting at them. No one is threatening them. No one will go to prison. No one will be tortured, and no one will be killed. And they are being openly and freely baptized as a family. I never dreamed that God could do such things. I never believed that I would live to see a miracle like this. This is a heart check. That when we see baptism, for us, it can be a very easy thing. It's an important thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay in what baptism is here. But when you think about it in the context of the, the world, do we see baptism and people publicly declaring their faith in this country as a miracle that I would have never dreamed that this could happen? Praise God for a country like America where we are free to worship. We are free to declare our faith. But there are plenty of people across the world where they do not have those liberties. They need people like you and me who have read their Bible, who have encountered the Lord, who have waited for the consolation of Israel to come, that we would go, that we would tell them about this Savior, about this baby. Simeon had faith before he ever held that baby in his hands. I have never seen Jesus face to face. One day I know I will. But before I ever saw him, I knew him. He is plainly revealed. That you would read your scriptures and know the Savior of the world. And for those people who don't have a copy of the Bible, who are unwilling to read it, be the light of Christ to them. 
so that when you and I stand before our Father in heaven, that we can show the blessing that we have had has not stayed with us, but that it would be passed on. He is revealing about the true nature and duty that this baby would accomplish. That's what Simeon's doing in that one verse, that he will divide, that Mary's heart would be broken. Understandably, she sees her son killed, tortured, murdered in front of her, even though he had done nothing wrong. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to try to speed it up here. We're going to look in verse 36 through 38, and we're finally getting to Anna. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84, or it could also be translated as 484 years. So we're not exactly 100% sure how old Anna is. She's 84 or over 100 to kind of give us the best kind of estimate. She's advanced in years, right, to describe how Zechariah describes his wife. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She is patient. If you look with me again, she did not depart from the temple. She was waiting for this moment. She was faithfully praising God regardless of if she saw that baby that day or not. She is excited. Jesus doesn't come late. He's right on time. He is timely. We see the way that she worships. She begins to give thanks and shares him with all who are waiting for the redemption. The people who are eagerly waiting, like Simeon, like those who died without seeing Christ revealed, our forefathers in the faith that who have trusted in Jesus. If you look in Hebrews 11, you can see a list of these people by faith, by faith. Abraham, Enoch, all of these people by faith were waiting for this moment, but he didn't reveal himself to them the way that he revealed himself to Anna or to Simeon. Jesus was right on time so that we would have this story that we would know. Anna was a widow for most of her life. She knows what sorrow and loneliness are like. This may be a season of sorrow, of loneliness for you. You might have lost a loved one this year. There might be an empty seat at the holiday table. This may bring up hard memories. This may be a difficult time knowing that mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, that spouse, that child, isn't there. But know that even in the midst of dealing with the loss of a loved one for over most of her life, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting. She was confident that one day the consoler, the comforter, the God of all comfort would come. She held God in the highest esteem, knowing that she would be comforted. Life is hard. We see even Mary is described as having a sword put through her soul. She knows what hard and heartache look like, yet she still worships. She still knows the Lord. She still is faithful in everything. We don't have to wait. Christ came in the fullness of time. We are not waiting for our consolation. We are not waiting for our redemption. We can be brought near to God because of Christ. Our last point is perfect. Perfect. Jesus is perfect. That's the standard you and I are called to. Perfection. Be holy as the Lord your God is holy. I try my best. You can look over there. I'll, I'll close my eyes. Mikhail will, not, will tell you I'm not perfect. My mom and dad are right over here. They will tell you I'm not perfect. Except when I was a little kid. Not at all. But that's the standard you and I are called to live up to. Perfection. It's about the center of Christmas. We've looked at the cast. We've looked at the things surrounding, effectively, the center of the Christmas story. We've looked at the importance of 
the faithfulness of Mary and Joseph, of Zechariah, of Elizabeth, of the shepherds. But if we just look at the people surrounding Jesus and not focus on Jesus, we have missed it. All of these people are important because of the centerpiece of the story. The centerpiece of Christmas in Jesus Christ. He is the only perfect one. I'm going to close us with Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. And it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. I know that's a big word, propitiation, but an important is he satisfied God's wrath for you and for me. That our sin broke a relationship that could never be restored. Adam, our first father, sinned in the garden, willfully disobeyed God's command, and humanity was plunged into brokenness forever since then. We have spent the last few months covering Genesis, and that's a very good story of brokenness. If you look across the Bible, you will only see broken people, except for one in Jesus Christ. And he was broken for me and for you. He took what you and I couldn't. He is like his brothers in every respect, human, circumcised, brought to the temple, tempted and tried, yet he never knew sin. He is the main point of Christmas. But you and I would know him. That's why he was born under the law. That's why his parents were righteous. That's why they were worshipers. That's why Simeon and Anna were told by God to wait for this moment because it's the biggest moment in history that when this baby was born, he was unlike any other person ever born before him. That he lived perfect his entire life, keeping the law, never yielding to sin, never giving in to sin. But he died the death that a criminal, a murderer, a sinner deserved. He died the death of me and of you. But God in his faithfulness raised him back from the dead because he didn't deserve to be dead and that he had paid the penalty completely. I have no concern over the sin in my life will not go unpaid. Jesus already paid for it. It was nailed to that cross, and I bear it no more. He died once so that you and I could turn from our sin and trust in Jesus. If you have never done that, I would invite you to come forward to find an elder, to find somebody to talk to regarding this. I'll be down to your left. Eric will be down to your right. There's a place for you to come kneel if you want to do that. There will be people in the back. But do not miss this opportunity. Jesus was timely. You should be timely. If the Lord, if the Holy Spirit is drawing you into this relationship, he's drawing you to seek repentance, he's drawing you to confess your sin, he's drawing you to pray, be obedient and faithful to that. That could look like being baptized. We, I read that quote. That's not to dissuade or to diminish anything that has ever been done in baptism in this church, but it's to help us understand what we are partaking in. That we are identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ and his life being born before baptism, before we go underwater, his death and being submerged under the waters and being raised back up to life out of the water. That's why we are Baptists. That is a beautiful image of the gospel and our identification with it. It may look like you becoming a member here. Whatever obedience is for you, do not miss it. Take this opportunity.